Yeah, I know. I need to get I need to get a, a little like lapel mic or something for this yeah, so that I can walk around. Yeah, something over there. And I could like picture it in my head, but I didn't know. <laughs> yep. Okay. Lewis structures. Now there is a little brightstorm video that you guys are not required to watch, but it goes over pretty much the same stuff in about a quarter of the time that I'm going to spend on it. Okay. Lewis structures. Now, just so you know what I'm talking about here, we're going to be drawing pictures of molecules, something like this. All right. Now, I want to start with a caution, though, and that is that some of you have learned to do this kind of thing before. And I want you to pretend you have not. Because the way you have learned before is different and not sufficient for some of the molecules we're going to be doing. In fact, you'll get them wrong if you use the, if you use the method of the illustrious Mr. Hand, for example. You may get into trouble. Yes? Those are electrons. Yeah, so these are electrons. Let's start with that. Basically, this is the idea. Uh, by the way, they're just valence electrons. So we're not, in these pictures, we never show the inner shell or inner level electrons, only the valence. And these are bonds. Now, which a bond, of course, is a pair of electrons, a shared pair. Now, by the old method or what you might have learned in middle school, here's what I mean. You might have done something like this, where you would start by drawing picture of oxygen like this with six valence electrons, right? And then you might have had a picture of hydrogen like this and another picture of hydrogen like this. And then you might have done something horrendous like this, okay? Do not connect the dots. Now there's a good reason for it because here's the thing. Connecting the dots makes sense because we're saying that basically they're sharing those electrons, right? And oftentimes it's true, two atoms will each contribute one unpaired electron to the bond. However, there's lots of times when only one atom contributes both electrons to the bond, and that would not work here. So there are many times when this method will simply not work. And in addition, I just don't like middle school, and so if I ever see this, you're going to get zero credit for it. Okay? So, don't do that. Now, I say that because here's the danger is that some of you, when I drew that thing up the top, you might have thought, oh, I know how to do this. So I'm just going to tune them out or whatever. Don't do that because the method I'm going to show you is is different and it's more broadly applicable. The Brightstorm girl uses the method I'm going to show you. Okay? And I know it's hard because if you learned a method and you were comfortable with it and you know how to do it and stuff, it's hard to switch. You don't want to switch. But you're going to have to or it's going to get ugly really fast. All right? Don't tell Mr. Hand that I said this, okay? Or what's the other science teacher down there? Sish. Sish. Don't tell them I said, okay. Of course, I'm just putting it on public record here by recording it and everything, so. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just not broadly applicable, okay? It's ingenious, except it's just not quite as broadly applicable. All right, so what is it? Step one. Now, before we start, though, um, why do we even care about this stuff? Well, here's the idea. It turns out that the arrangement of the atoms is just important as what the atoms are. In determining the properties of a compound, the arrangement of the atoms, the arrangement in space, the arrangement and geometry Yes, we're going to be talking a little bit about geometry. Although there won't be any side angle side or side 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 or blah 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 in here. Okay? Geometry. I didn't say that either. We will talk about geometry in here, but not the kind of stuff you're getting in uh, in geometry class. Okay, arrangement and geometry are 
essential to determine. I mean, it could literally make the difference between a compound being toxic and being essential for life. Same elements, same numbers of atoms, just hook them up differently to each other and you totally change the properties. Okay? So that's why we're interested in knowing how things are put together. Step one. Essential to determining the properties of a compound. Step one, count the valence electrons. Valence electrons means outer shell. So like if, it, if the outermost shell is, is 2, like 2s2, 2p5, then it would have 7 valence electrons. And I'll show you how that works. First of all, if you look at the periodic table, <coughs> you can easily figure out valence electrons. And actually, all we need is the p block because we're always dealing with nonmetals here. So I'm just going to draw the p block only, the last six columns. This is column or group 13, group 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. <clears throat> the number of valence electrons are 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 valence electrons. So all you got to do is locate the, the element on the periodic table, and you can easily figure out uh, how many valence electrons it has. So boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon. Fluorine would have seven. Oxygen would have six. So, so oxygen has six valence electrons, for example. Yes? Why do we only use this to Because we're talking about covalent bonding here. And that only happens with the nonmetals. So we don't need to worry about how many valence electrons sodium has or potassium. So Lewis structure only for bonds? Yes. Yep, we only draw Lewis structures for covalent bonds generally. It won't. This is it right here. If it was two, it would be an alkaline earth metal. And it wouldn't form a covalent bond, so we wouldn't draw Lewis structure. It would just, it would, it has two valence electrons, that's true, but it's going to form an ionic bond. So we wouldn't draw a Lewis structure for it. But it does have two. So the alkali metals have one valence electron, the alkaline earth metals have two. We're just not worried about them at this point because we're only dealing with nonmetals. Now let's look at, we're going to look at three examples. Uh, just start with a simple compound, and then we're going to get a little bit more complicated, and then a little more complicated. <clears throat> just so you can see how to deal with different issues as they come up. So the first step is to count valence electrons. Here's how I'm going to do that. Where is phosphorus on the table? It's right underneath nitrogen. So phosphorus has five valence electrons. I'm still doing step one, which is to count the valence electrons. Phosphorus has five. Chlorine has seven, but there are three chlorines. So there are three chlorines. See that number three there? I'm multiplying. What I'm trying to do here is how many total valence electrons are there on the whole molecule? So you find each element, and then you add them all up. So it's going to be 5 plus 21 is 26. This is the total valence electrons. <clears throat> For sulfate, I'm just going to do the same thing. Sulfur has six because it's underneath oxygen right here. Oxygen has six and there are four oxygens. But I actually have to add two. Does anyone know why I'm adding two? Blake. <clears throat> exactly. Two minus charge. We talked about this when we first introduced the concept of polyatomic ions. A polyatomic ion is a molecule with extra electrons. 
So those extras are in the valence shell. So I take those two negatives. That's, that means two additional electrons in a, added to the whole molecule. So I'm adding them up onto the valence electrons. So it has a negative charge the electron negative, but it right. has more of them. More of them. So I'm, right now I'm just counting electrons. Yeah. So 6 and 24 is 30, and 2 is 32. This, by the way, is about all the math you got to do in this unit. Other than, actually, I shouldn't say that. Balancing the charge in those formulas is, is a little trickier, right? Okay, SO3. 6 plus 6 times 3. 24. Okay, the first step is pretty easy. Just, you got you to be a little careful. Just make sure you're using the table correctly and finding the right number of electrons. Make sure you're multiplying by however many atoms there are. And make sure you're taking account of charge of a polyatomic ion charge. Yes? How is that possible? This is a whole molecule. There's going to be eight around each atom. And you got more than more than one atom, so you're going to have a lot of valence electrons. These are all the valence electrons on all the atoms. Yes. Okay. So next step. Any other question on step one? Next step. Step two. Draw a skeleton structure for the molecule. I'm not done yet. Draw this skeleton structure of the molecule with lines for bonds. Now, there's no dots yet. We haven't even drawn any dots yet. See, that's the thing. In this method, we're drawing lines before we've even drawn dots. The bonds take priority here. So, here we go. This one becomes this. OK, now a couple of questions might arise at this point. Why did I put one in the middle and three on the outside? This is the most common form of molecule we're going to see in this class. It's got a central atom surrounded by other atoms. It's symmetrical. So you got one atom in the middle and then more atoms around the outside. Almost every molecule we do is going to have that basic kind of format. All right? So a central atom surrounded by other atoms. So this kind of center with spokes or kind of a wheel shape is what we're going to be seeing for the most part. So if you're in doubt, and you could draw it many different ways, by the way, right? I mean, what I'm saying is, why didn't I write CLCLCLP? right in a line just because this is the most common nature tends to favor symmetry so we're going for the higher level of symmetry so when in doubt you are going to favor symmetry you want a, a higher order of symmetry in your molecule and then also the least Electronegative atom goes in the middle, in the center. That's because it doesn't have as strong a hold on its electrons, and it can get taken advantage of by the others. So like in this case, those chlorines are taking advantage of the phosphorus. They are, they're all teaming up against it <coughs> and taking its electrons. They're not totally taking them. They're, they're sharing. You know? But sharing is not always pleasant, is it? So that's what I did. I got PCL3. Now look at the le next one. is going to be the same. What do you think is going to happen? The S is going to go in the middle, and the oxygens are going to go around the outside like this. Those lines are bonds. And 
then the last one is similar to the first because it's got a one atom surrounded by three, SO3, like that. <coughs> so we've already done quite a bit. We've got a basic structure of the molecule going. But we're not done, as you might have guessed, step three. Questions on step two? Least electronegative just means if you look at the table, um, like a halogen would always be on the outside because they have a high electronegativity. Remember, it goes like up like this. Like fluorine has the highest, so left to right electronegativity increases, decreases top to bottom. So something that's further to the left or further up in the table is going to tend to be on the outside. Either would probably work. Okay, step three. Subtract two electrons for each bond. So in other words, each bond stands for two electrons. So subtract two electrons for each bond from the total valence electrons for the molecule. So in PCL3, PCL3, I have six electrons. There's two there, there's two there, there's two there. So I'm going to take 26 minus 6 equals 20. <clears throat> that 6 is from three bonds. Each bond is a shared pair. Each bond is a pair of electrons being shared between the atoms. Each bond is a shared pair. So in this next one, in sulf sulfate, this one's 32 minus 8, because there are four bonds. 2, 2, 2, 2. Each bond stands for two electrons. If you remember from last time, a covalent bond is a shared pair. Last one. That, like, Go ahead. No, it's true. What happens is, see, what we're doing is the bonds are valence electrons, right? But what we're trying to do is figure out how the valence electrons are going to be distributed over the whole molecule. So we start with, well, how many do I have to distribute? But the basic idea of what we're doing is we're figuring out total number of valence electrons, and then we're going to try to distribute them to give everybody eight. All right? And we're giving the bonds priority, so we have to have the bonds. Now, basically, what's happened at this point is we've used up six in this one. We've used up eight here, and we've used up six on this one. This is 24 minus six equals 18. So... Yep. So we're, it's not like it's wrong. Right. It wasn't wrong. That was the total valence electrons. In fact, there's still valence electrons. It's just that they're already accounted for. There are 24 in the middle one here in sulfate. There's 24 remaining to be distributed. The bonds, these six electrons, six electrons are accounted for now. They are spoken for. They're needed for the bonds. And you'll see in the next step. Yes? It added two electrons to the valence shell, to the valence electrons. Okay, so we don't have to deal with it. We don't have to deal with it anymore until the very end. And I'll show you at the very end, we just make a note of it. Right. Yeah. But it already had its effect right here. When we added them in, that's when it had its effect, the charge. 
So I subtract. Now I'm going step by step here. So if you don't fully understand what's happening, that's okay because we're going step by step. I subtract electrons for the bonds, and then step. Is this four? Step four. I am going to distribute. Distribute the remaining valence electrons so that each atom has an octet. That means eight, right? Each atom is surrounded by eight. So here I go. I got, this is what I have so far with my PCL3. And this right here in step three, it told me that I have 20 electrons left. I've used up six to make the bonds. Okay? I used up six to make the bonds. Now I've got 20 remaining. Put them in pairs like this, just like you did in middle school. Put them in pairs like this. That uses six. Now that chlorine is, is satisfied at this point. That chlorine has an octet because remember, bond counts for two. So I've got two, four, six, eight. And the bond, by the way, counts double. It counts for both atoms. The bond counts for two for chlorine and phosphorus. So two, four, six, eight. That chlorine is all set. There's another six to make that chlorine happy. I'm on 12. I've used up 12 of the 20 that I had left. Now I've used up 18 of the 20 that I had left. And now I finish off by filling up phosphorus with two, like that. Now if we check, we'll see that each one of the atoms has eight. Two, four, six, eight. Two, four, six, eight. And then two, four, six, eight. Okay. Is it kind of magically work out like that every time? No. <clears throat> this is the simplest case where it just works out the first time and you're like, nice. So everybody's happy, everybody has an octet. Just keep in mind, bonds count for two, and they count for whatever atoms they are touching. The same bond, the same two electrons are used by two atoms to fill their valence shell. Okay? Now the next one is similar. It's just got more electrons, but it's going to work out as well. So this one, we had a shape like this, and we've got 24. And if you look, there's four oxygens, and each one needs six more electrons to fill up its octet. It doesn't matter what atom it is on the outside. We're still trying to achieve Yep, same thing. Yep. The only exception to the octet rule is hydrogen, which is satisfied with only two electrons. Well, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, you're going to know hydrogen can't have eight electrons around it. It wouldn't be hydrogen. Right. So it'd be hydrogen plus eight or something. It have right. It only goes up to two. But that's the only exception. Now, this one then is done. So you might actually be done at step four. Last thing, though, with the ion, I mentioned we want to make a note of the charge at the end. Just to. We need some way of indicating that this is a charged molecule. So you put the whole thing in brackets and put a 2 minus on the corner. All right? Now is when we come to a little bit more complicated situation. Wait, why is that 2 minus? Is it that shown in the diagram? It was up here. And we're just making a note of it down here also, just like we did in the formula. And we have to make that note, because yep. otherwise you would have known. Yeah, otherwise you would think it could be just plain old SO4. Right. Okay. And this would actually be the incorrect diagram for SO4, because you'd be missing two electrons. In other words, this structure would not work for SO4 neutral. It, you needed, we needed those two minus. In fact, it's a good explanation of why SO4 has a two minus charge. It needs it in order to form this shape. Now, how about this one? 
we had, what, 18 electrons remaining, right? I can see right away I've got a problem because I have three oxygens, they all need six. So I got issues. I can fill up these oxygens, but there's a gaping hole right here. Sulfur is not satisfied. So step five. Step five is if you don't have enough electrons, you have too few make a double bond and return to step which step three so we're going to do that for this sulfate. Now, by the way, it doesn't matter which oxygen I put this on. They're all the same. They're all the same element. So just put a double bond in there somewhere. It turns out that double bond is actually shared by the three oxygens. But we're going to leave it just like that. And now I return to the step three, which was subtract two electrons for each double bond. I started with 24. Now it's 24 minus 8, because now I have four bonds. Gives me 16. Now, at first glance, it looks like, well, you just got yourself in even more trouble because now you have fewer electrons. But watch what happens. You can already see just looking at that, sulfur is already satisfied. Sulfur has four bonds, eight electrons. Sulfur goes two, four, six, eight. Right? So all I have to do now is fix up the oxygens. One, two, three, four, five, six. That one's all set. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That one's all set. This one only needs four. Look at that magic. Two, four, six, eight. That oxygen is all set. So double bonds actually conserve electrons. So if you run into a problem where you get to step four and you don't have enough electrons to fill up the octets, octets of all the atoms, you just add another bond. You double one up. If that doesn't work, double another one up. And if that doesn't work, double another one up, and so on. Actually, if you doubled another one up, you would have an expanded octet in the central atom. If you had three double bonds, you'd have six bonds around the central atom, which would be 12 electrons. All right, that's step five. Do you want to know about step six? No. Okay, step six. If you have too many, electrons. And here, these are not very common, but um, I'll show you. Uh, let's not show you that one. I'm just going to mess with you anymore. Wait. PF5, is that it? No, let's do this one. Sorry. We got issues right away because I'm thinking, wait a minute here, that's a noble gas. And it's true, but you're dealing here with fluorine, which is the most reactive element on the periodic table. And it turns out that under some conditions, fluorine can actually bond with xenon. So xenon, though, would have eight valence electrons. Fluorine would have seven times four, so that's, what, <clears throat> 28 and 8, 36, right? 36. That's a lot of valence electrons, but let's see what happens. We'll draw our skeleton structure. <clears throat> Subtract our 8. 36 minus 8. 28. 
but it's only going to take 24 to fill up all the fluorines. What do I do with the extra four? See, in this case, this is totally different than step five. In this case, I actually had four extra. I'm all, everybody's already filled up with eight, but I still have four electrons left. So what do you do? You just put them around the central atom. Now this, you got nowhere else to put them. Why not? This is called an expanded octet. And what's actually happening here, folks, is the D sublevel that's below the outer shell is getting pulled up into the valence shell and merged with it. Why? Because fluorine is so darn strong that it's able to suck the electrons from the inside of the atom and make them get involved in bonding. It's basically what it's doing. Right. This pretty much only happens with like fluorine and chlorine, I think. Maybe oxygen would do it too, I'm not sure. So this is exceptional. Yeah, it's exceptional. Last thing I want to show you is step seven. <coughs> step seven. Oh, check your work. That's a good one. That's step eight. Step seven is, we'll just call them electron deficient. molecules. And you know these right away. You know these right away because there's an uneven number. There's an odd number of valence electrons. You know you're going to have a problem with that because, um, well, that's one way of knowing is when you have an odd number. Um, is it always true? Uh, there might be other cases, but let's look at an odd number, something like um, this guy. No. Five and six. I know I've got problems right away because I know that bonds form in pairs and that the electrons pair up around the atom, so I've got issues because I've got an odd number. But I'm going to go ahead and try it anyway because I'm crazy like that. So I'm going to do a skeleton structure. Now I have 11 minus 2, which gives me 9. Let's try and fill it up. I take 6 for that. No way I'm going to have enough. Let's throw a double bond on there. 11 minus 4. Leaves me with 7. It's going to take 4 to fill up the nitrogen. All I've got left is 3. Look at that ugly thing. This, when you have an unpaired electron, unpaired valence electron, the molecule is called, or the atom, a radical. And they're generally not, um, they're not good like in biological systems because they're highly reactive. It's not a stable situation, so the thing really wants to react with other molecules, and so they're generally not good for you. Free radicals, yeah, that's where you hear free radicals. They might, actually, yeah. Yeah, like would NO bond with NO, then it would be N2O2. I think that might work, I'm not sure. All right, uh, another case of electron deficient is there are cases where you don't have a full octet, but you're okay anyway. Um, this is a this is an example, and these aren't things you could figure out on your own, folks. Uh, this one here, <coughs> this is actually the the correct Lewis structure for boron trifluoride, and this does not have an octet. I don't. I think that. This is actually stable as it is. And I don't know why boron is funny like that. Boron, and I think beryllium does this as well. You know beryllium's a metal. It does BEF2, forms a covalent bond with fluorine. And just before, before we're done here, I want to show you uh, water. Just to emphasize that hydrogen is an exception to the octet rule. This would be 2 times 1 for the, for the hydrogens plus 6 
gives me eight valence electrons. Step two, I would draw the skeleton structure like that. I put oxygen in the middle because I'm favoring symmetrical arrangement. Now I've got eight minus four because I have two bonds. And I've got four more electrons and I put them here. Why didn't I put any around the hydrogen? Because hydrogen is going to be full with one S2. There's, you're not going to go to one S8 or something like that. So hydrogen is full with two, not eight. Everything else other than hydrogen and helium are going to be full with eight. Helium you don't need to worry about because it doesn't bond. NOH. NOH. That's a good question. Would you have something like this? I think you do. I think you can get that molecule. Yeah. We'll play around with those more next time, folks. Uh, for the weekend, we have a quiz on Monday. And uh, I guess that's it. So you can just study your naming. This isn't going to be Yes, this will not be on the quiz.